Well, welcome to today's show. Today, we have Will Banduho from Fitzpatrick Insurance Solutions. And Will is going to talk to us about um, insurance markets in multifamily. So, Will, welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Why don't we start off with uh, just a little bit of background on yourself uh, for our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, from San Antonio originally, um, went to UT Austin, and I got into Fitzpatrick. You know, shortly after that, I've been there a little over eight years, um, and just been doing the multifamily gig ever since. Um, Fitzpatrick. I think we were founded in two thousand five by Eric Fitzpatrick. And he kind of started off doing a little bit of everything and then transitioned into multifamily shortly after. And we've just been solely focused on multifamily for about the last 10 years or so. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, in, in your eight years, what, what have you seen as the trends in multifamily? Yeah, very good question. Um, when I started, it was, you know, the softest market we had seen in a long time. You know, I'm sure you guys as investors were seeing and ballparking rates for insurance that, you know, $200 a door, $300 a door. And then about three to four years ago, um, really three, three years ago, we saw the market just do a complete 180. And now we're in the hardest market that, you know, I've ever seen and career veterans have ever seen. Um, so I would say that's been the biggest change going from a very, very soft market to a very hard market in a short amount of time. Um, it really almost flipped overnight. It wasn't a gradual transition to where rates just went up and up. Um, they almost doubled at what seemed like overnight. So I would say that's been the biggest transition. Uh, you know, and, and, and you know, on that transition part, uh, you know, obviously as single family uh, owners, we have seen some of the impact of insurance uh, for our houses, particularly due to, you know, emerging weather risks and storm risks and things like that. Uh, have you seen a similar pattern in multifamily space, particularly along the Gulf Coast, you know, Houston, uh, and places in general where there seems to be a perception of increased weather risk? Yeah, absolutely. I think you've seen in the Houston, Corpus, Galveston markets, um, the hurricane or convective wind exposed areas, they have seen significant increases. And really you've seen carriers emphasize increases on their retentions. Higher deductibles, um, I would say, are a main, main driver in that space. But yeah, we've seen the tougher risk have certainly taken the brunt of it, um, but even the inland stuff is now kind of starting to follow suit. Have you seen any change in the number of providers for insurance in, let's say, in Texas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've seen a lot of carriers kind of exit the space, and even the ones who are in the space are taking smaller lines. And what that means is if you have a $10 million property, well, maybe four years ago, you've had one carrier and they would give you the full $10 million worth of insurance. Whereas today, they're only taking the first two and a half million dollars worth of risk. And then you've got to get two, three, four carriers to fill out that remaining total insured value of your property. So there's less carriers and smaller lines. So it's kind of a perfect storm going on. And, and how would you quantify less carriers? I mean, let's say eight years ago or five years ago, how many were there and how many are there today insuring in, let's say, Texas? You know, it kind of depends on the risk. Um, it depends on the size. You know, for a bigger schedule, you're going to need more carriers. For a smaller apartment complex, you know, you need fewer. So it's tough to really put a number on it, but I would say we've seen quite a few carriers leave the space and then the ones that are still there kind of tighten their lines. Has there been any new entrants to the space to backfill the folks that have left? There are, there are new entrants, um, very few, and they're being very selective. Um, you know, they're not just jumping in the deep end. Um, they're kind of, you know, picking and choosing what they want to write and being very selective. Um, I think, you know, I'm sure we'll touch on this of why rates have kind of gone up, but for the longest time, insurance carriers made all of their money on investments. They were never profitable. I think eight out of the last 35 years, they've been profitable actually writing insurance. And so that is one thing that has changed is now they've started putting an emphasis on, hey, we're gonna be profitable actually writing insurance. Um, and that's one of the reasons why all of this stuff is tightening up. Got it. Uh, so, so uh, Will, obviously, uh, 
you know, for us as uh, apartment owners, uh, operators, investors, insurance is one of the uncontrollable expenses. And so, you know, when we underwrite deals, uh, we pay a lot of attention trying to understand uh, what insurance costs should be. Uh, could you give, provide some guidance on how we should approach this, how investors should approach assessing what insurance will be post acquisition? Uh, you know, give us some guidance on how we should approach it, how we should approach talking to you, what information you'd like to see, just overall big picture guidance uh, on that topic. Yeah, certainly. When you know my clients come to me, one, I think everyone should you know consult an expert before, even if you're just looking at a deal, before you submit your LOI. Um, an expert in the space should give you be able to give you kind of a general idea of what they see in that market or with a property like that. But what I tell my clients, what I'm looking for is you know stuff that you can usually get from the sellers prior to to submitting your LOI is you know the wiring type. Um, if it's straight aluminum wiring, that's going to be a significant issue for carriers. And what's recently come up is stab lock breakers or Federal Pacific breakers. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that term. Um, it's a huge fire hazard and carriers have a major issue with that. And it's also a huge expense to get corrected. Um, I have a deal right now where they, you know, found the coverage and, you know, didn't know that there were stab locks out there and it's going to be $150,000 to correct them all. So that's a huge out-of-pocket expense that was probably not baked into, you know, their underwriting when they brought the property. So I would say wiring and breakers are two big things to look at pre-acquisition, but then you just have to consult an expert um, and get a good idea of what is going on in that market market for similar property types. Unfortunately, you know, there's no kind of crystal ball for investors to just look at a property and know exactly what they're going to be paying. Right. Yeah, no, that's definitely a, a risk out there. And, uh, you know, to that point, just digging into that a little bit deeper, uh, have you run into situations uh, and maybe you can give some thoughts on how the, it can be mitigated where, hey, look, the investor comes to you, you give them initial guidance based on experience, knowledge of the property, things like that. They get into due diligence and find, uncover other potential issues that could uh, bump up premiums. Uh, can you talk through that? I've seen situations like that. What could be done to help mitigate that and try to manage the variability on, on, on the premium side? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we're not in a market right now where people are really getting reductions in premiums. I think a better way to phrase the question would be what can owners and operators do to mitigate their costs rising sharply. And the number one thing is loss control. Um, careful tenant screening, you know, make sure everything at the property is up to code. The railings are good. The parking lot is, you know, smooth. There's not bumps and cracks and holes. Um, on the liability side, the main thing we see from claims is slip and falls. You know, people falling down the stairs or falling in the parking lot and, and suing their owners. Um, you know, on the property side, stovetop fire suppressors um, are a good one. So I think that would be the best way to phrase that is what you can do to avoid claims. No, well done. Um, what what uh, have you seen in the past year in terms of if you were to say, you know, Texas, and maybe you can, you know, look at that by class, what what have the insurance rates, you know, been in the increases over the past year? I would say, I mean, they're certainly going up. Um, Percentage-wise, it's tough to put a put a price on it. You know, maybe in the Houston market, closer to Galveston, you've seen rates go up 100 percent versus, you know, San Antonio, Austin, you've seen 10 to 20 percent. But it all comes down to valuation, and I think that's something that we will continue to see in the year or years ahead. The carriers are putting a huge emphasis on. Um, when I started in the business, carriers would write blanket coverage, meaning they'd give you, again, if you had a $10 million property, 10 buildings, let's say, they would just give you a blanket $10 million limit, but they would value your property at $55 a square foot. When, you know, let's say if you had a building burned down, the rebuild cost was actually $150 a square foot. Well, now carriers are saying, you know, no more free money we're going to charge you for what we've actually been paying these claims all these years. So these property owners who have had their valuations way under par for you know years are now coming to pay the piper. So if you have an adequate valuation, you're probably not seeing the increases that others are. 
But historically, many of these properties, especially in the B and C class space, have been getting away with $55, $65, $75 a square foot. So most of the increase is coming not from the actual rate of insurance, but the increase in valuation. And I think that's something we'll continue to see here in the future. Uh, on that on that point, uh, Will, you know, you, you speak to multiple insurance underwriters. Uh, you know, Ryan and I are, are markets folks, Macca's background, uh, so I'll use the term arbitrage. Uh, do you see a consistent approach to underwriting insurance risk from the providers, or is there an arbitrage opportunity here where, hey, you put it out to 10 different providers and you get a great deal from one and not so great deal from other? Do you see, do you see a convergence, or is there, is there still opportunity to get a better deal from one provider versus another? Um, I, I would say in this market, no. Um, many of them take the same approach. Like I said, many of them are pushing valuations and it's not a very competitive market where you send it to 10 carriers and they're all wanting to jump on this business. They're really kind of wanting to see, you know, the last look of, hey, you know, we don't really want this, but we will ride it. Um, and that's more tailored towards the B and C class stuff. On the A class, newer, nicer, sprinkler, good markets, there is more competition and more carriers who are willing and wanting to write that. So you can get, you know, better rates and better deals. But when you get those, you know, 1960s frames and VFW, it's not a very desired asset. And so there's not many carriers willing to bend over backwards to win the business. It kind of is what it is. Got it. And, and has that been borne out by history? So, you know, clearly insurance companies are, from what you're saying, you know, they're trying to be more conscious about risk assessments and some of the potential risks that might be there in a class C versus a class A, but has that been borne out historically? Like, you know, claims have been much higher for class C in general than a class A and, and do the premiums kind of justify it in your, in your mind? Yeah, I think that goes back to the underwriters really wanted to drive profitability. Um, so, you know, they can look through all their metrics of what, you know, what assets they paid out on claims and, you know, I don't have that information in front of me or access to what, you know, they've done, but I'm sure they do. And I guess historically, those older assets typically, you know, tend to perform worse than the nicer, newer stuff. You know, you've got older construction, um, you know, typically older roofs and stuff like that. And a lot of people want to point at the big weather events, which is, you know, there was last year, there was 21, $1 billion weather events throughout the globe. Um, but again, in Texas, a state like Texas, there's just a lot of attritional losses. DFW hails every single year. So while there are those major weather events, just the daily claims begin to add up as well. And I think that's something that's driving the market. You know, you mentioned things that uh, owners can do, the, the fire suppressors and, you know, do you have any brands or any, you know, type of product? I've seen a few different ones, one where it comes down from the, the vent hood, another one where um, it just turns off the stove um, for electric or gas, but any, any types of products or anything else that you think would be, would be helpful there? You know, I don't know the brand name and off the top of my head, I think we have a partnership with, um, like Louisville Fire Company or something where you can, uh, I can get you guys all that info. I don't know the brand off the top of my head. Um, I'm not really an expert in that space, but uh, we can certainly put you in touch with someone who is. Okay. And then, um, you know, to prevent slips and falls and so forth, I mean, you said, is there anything else? I mean, notices that you can send to residents? I mean, anything that can kind of foolproof or prevent um, something from happening? Um, I mean, certainly make sure all your residents carry renter's insurance. That's something we see often where, you know, they sign the lease and they provide the renter's insurance and then a month in, um, you know, they quit paying it and then, you know, they don't have renter's insurance and then the tenant causes a kitchen fire and, you know, they've got nothing to cover it on their end. Um, there's a couple of good products for owners that provide, you know, it's a setup where this company comes in and puts an addendum on all the leases where the owner can actually provide the tenants renters insurance, and it gives them up to a certain amount of coverage. And that's a good way to shield yourselves for some liability of any claims caused by the tenant. Um, as regards to the liability claims, the slip and falls and stuff, you know, make sure your property is, is well lit, really just cover all your bases on your end to mitigate those claims. 
On, uh, so, so Will, let's say we, you know, unfortunately have a claim on a property. There's a fire, whatever the case might be, and there ends up being a claim on the property. Uh, can you talk through how the claim is initiated, what the process looks like, what should owners expect in terms of timeline? So let's say, you know, fire happens, two units get destroyed, uh, you know, no rent for a while. Clearly you can have rent insurance uh, that compensates you for that period. But, you know, how long does that, what's the timeline? I know it's each, each case is probably different, but just give us some guidance on what an owner should expect in terms of resolution to an insurance and the process of, of that. As yeah, well. yeah, great question. I mean, it's it's our goal to make that process as easy and seamless as possible. You know, this morning, if one of your properties caught fire, you would just, you know, give me a call, shoot me an email, kind of the claims, details, everything that happened, and we'd get it filed right away with the carrier. You typically get an adjuster out there within one to three days is probably a good rule of thumb. Um, and they'll come out, assess the claim, you know, give you an estimate of what they think the damage is. And then hopefully the process gets going right away. Typically a carrier will come out and cut you a check for the actual cash value, um, the current state of the property right away. And those funds should help alleviate some of the pain and really begin the work. And then, you know, you have two options. If you have a whole building burned down, you could just take the actual cash value check and take the money and run. Most people want the replacement cost and want to fully rebuild their asset. So again, like you mentioned, each claim is different, you know, replacing two units, who knows, that might take three to six months. I've had claims where a full 12 unit building burns down and, you know, they're still going on 18 months later repairing the building. So each claim is different, but again, it hopefully should be a pretty seamless process once you file the claim and the adjuster gets out there. And a lot of the carriers we work with are very involved in the claims process and keep current throughout the process, working with the owners hand in hand to make sure everything goes smoothly. And Will, how involved do you get in that process? It really depends. It's a case by case. Like I said, we work with freight carriers and adjusters um, that typically do a very good job. And so we don't have to get involved. Um, once we file the claim, it's you know somewhat out of our hands, but certainly if there was an issue um, where you say, hey, they're not being responsive or, hey, we think this is, you know, worth more, blah, 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 then we can get involved in the process. But ideally, you know, once we pass it off to the adjuster, hopefully it goes smoothly and the carrier does their job. And is there, you know, I've, I've, I guess I've been to different trade shows and they have consultants that, you know, offer to help with that process. I mean, is that, do you think, you know, of, let's say 10 cases, I mean, how many involve these types of consultants? versus, you know, not using those folks? You know, I think it depends again. Um, I think if there's a discrepancy on what the owner thinks, you know, maybe the claim was worth versus what the carrier thinks, you can get, you know, a third party adjuster. Um, I know there are a few carriers who are launching products to say, hey, you know, when you sign up for our insurance, you need to sign off that, you know, when there's a claim, you're going to use our providers, you know, our adjusters, because one thing is insurance is, is there to indemnify. You know, it's there to make you whole. It's not there to make you better. Um, and often enough, people have a claim and say, hey, you know, we're going to make this brand new and upgrade this and that. And I think sometimes you get these third party adjusters in there who, you know, turn a million dollar claim into a two million dollar claim. Um, and maybe that's one reason why, you know, the profitability has not been there for these carriers. So I don't know. It, it really depends on the client. Some people call a third party out there adjuster immediately. And some just let it play out. I don't think I have a, a good rule of thumb on that. On the on the point about uh, responsiveness of the under uh, the insurance company, uh, you don't have to name names, obviously. But in your experience, is there a differentiation on the quality of response and the quality of timeline and things like that that an investor should take into account before choosing a particular provider? You know, most of these adjusters that the carriers use are third party adjusters that they have you know, big contracts with, I think like um, a big one is Ingle Martin, you know, so a lot of these carriers are using the same claims adjusters. So um, I wouldn't say there's been, you know, someone that's more responsive than not. I will say um, typically most multifamily, especially in the BNC class is all in the excess and surplus lines markets. Um, so they're carriers that take on more risk. 
versus standard line carriers like Farmers, Geico, AIG, Liberty Mutual. Um, those guys typically do not operate in this space, um, but they will operate in kind of the newer A class space. And I will say, typically the admitted carriers, you know, the farmers and the Liberty Mutuals, you know, they'll cut you a check yesterday for a claim. Um, they're typically more responsive, I think, probably just given their scale. Um, but again, we haven't had any significant issues with any of our carriers. Could you see new entrants like that? I mean, you said Geico and so forth play in the A space. Would they ever go into the B and C space? I don't think so. Um, I think there's probably just a little bit too much risk there for them. Um, so one, one thing that we've seen is some property management companies offering insurance and as a way, I don't know if they're diversifying or pooling their different properties and offering some blanket policies, um, but can you provide some color on that and how that may or may not help um, clients and potentially the, the risks involved in that? Yeah, absolutely. We see that all the time. Um, there's a couple of them. I think, you know, probably one of the biggest ones you come across is Asset Plus or what is it now? Asset Living. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah. They've got a huge schedule. You know, God knows how many they've got, you know tens of thousands of units. And I actually think it's a great, great option that they offer their clients, um, especially one benefit can be on those schedules. Let's say you have, you're buying a property and it had a $2 million fire claim a year ago. Well, if you were just going to go get standalone insurance on that, the rates are probably going to be pretty significant, but adding it to a schedule like asset plus where they're just blending it in with their thousands and thousands of units, sometimes that can help alleviate a lot of the pain for those owners. So I think that's one benefit you get from those guys. Um, a lot of times owners, you know, it's, it's nice to not have to deal with your insurance when you've got someone else working for you every year and knowing that you're getting pretty good rates. So yeah, I think when you can get on one of those management schedules, typically it's a good plus. And is there any, you know, do you get a max, is it like you're insured for your property as if you weren't on that? Or is it, hey, if there's losses across the whole portfolio, everyone may get allocated, you know, back or? It, it really depends. I, it, who knows? They're, they're all probably scheduled or uh, structured differently. I, I would imagine you're typically going to be covered for the full amount of your property. Okay. But for example, um, maybe kind of what you're hitting on is a shared limits deal where, you know, they might have $500 million per occurrence. So on any given occurrence, they've got up to $500 million to pay out any losses. Um, but all those companies do a uh, you know probable, probable maximum loss scenario. I think they have actuaries run all that stuff. So chances are during one of those, it's probably pretty adequately run. Okay, great. That's uh, very useful, Will. Um, so, you know, with that, you know, clearly you've been in the space for a while, um, you know, not looking for investment advisor, obviously, but uh, what should uh, new investors, uh, can you give some guidance on new investors or people entering the space, how should, how they should be thinking about insurance, any big picture idea, ideas, guidance, uh, advice that you could share, uh, you know, if you're investing in a deal, should you be looking at what type of coverage the, the deal has in it, um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think a main thing, if, if I was going to invest in a deal, as I touched on earlier, carriers used to offer, you know, blanket coverage, whereas now we're seeing more carriers go to a scheduled policy. So if you had a 10 building property worth 10 million, carriers are now putting a specified limit on each one of those buildings. So if I was going to invest in a deal, I would want to make sure that we have an adequate valuation, that if one of those buildings burn down, that we've got enough coverage to replace it and our loss of rents are going to be there um, to back that up. So that's something that I would look for um, in coverage. Again, I would want to make sure that whoever the sponsor was, was working with an expert in that field. Um, there's a ton of great agents out there in the multifamily space. There's no reason not to use one. So I, those are probably two things that I would look for if I was just kind of taking a hands-off approach and didn't have any background in the space. So many there. Yep. I think uh, that was great. Awesome. Well, Will, thank you so much for making the time for us. Um, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Um, yeah, you can reach me. Uh, the easiest way is my cell phone, 210-667-8755. Um, available pretty much 24-7. Um, and then you can get my email as William B as a boy at fisinsure.com. 
I would say those are the two, two fastest ways to get in touch with me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Yeah, thank I you. really appreciate you guys having me on. Um, it's always good to talk a little insurance. <laughs> Thanks again.